today. There's a diaconate meeting on Wednesday. Um, we, we do have some, some things going on with uh, trustee business, but that seems to be taken care of. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so uh, today is just a great day to be together. What a beautiful day this is. Isn't it pretty? I, I, I can't believe it that he could outdo yesterday for today. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for all that God's done this week and, and the things that he's doing. But uh, I have a few prayer requests that I'd like to just mention, and then I'll uh, read the scripture. Uh, Janet Grimes, uh, she's at home with a really, really, really bad uh, sinus headache. Uh, we, we always want to remember to pray for our travelers, and especially our schools and our kids and our teachers right now. Because this is, a, this is a time when everything's kind of in an upheaval. Nobody knows what's going on yet. But anyway, pray for them. And then Richie Zola, I don't know if you all got the prayer request this week about Richie. He does have Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, he just started antibiotics, and it should be a, uh, probably a little bit longer cure than it would normally be. But uh, And the good news is, is they tested him for COVID, and he is negative. So we're, we're pretty, pretty happy about that. And uh, are there any other, other announcements that I'm forgetting or leaving out? Anybody? You folks uh, via the internet, I, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, <laughs> I can't take your requests this way. <laughs> but you can, you can email them in to me if you want. But anyway, uh, today's scripture. Um, Psalm 63. I don't know if you're familiar with Psalm 63 or not, but we used to teach this as a song to our kids. Uh, oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings... I will rejoice. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us today to be here at Plymouth and to be a part of your wonderful kingdom and plan for this day and age. 
God, I would say, last hours of, of eternity, but we don't know that. And Lord, though it may appear to be that, we are truly thankful that you've given us this time, as, as uh, Esther said, for such a time as this. And so, God, today we do live in a, in a precarious time and world, but God, you've given your church the opportunity and the call and the responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So today, our God, we ask your blessing upon our service here, upon the services that are going on across this world, that, God, you would bless the pastors, bless the hearers of the word, and, God, that your Holy Spirit would be in each and every service. Now, our God, today, we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said together with me, amen. Well, let's sing our first hymn, okay? that's going on, Lord Jesus, come quickly. That's my prayer today, that he would come quickly. But I know that he's given us a responsibility and he's given us a call to go and preach the gospel. So today, uh, our prayers uh, will be united together. If you have prayer requests, please drop them in the prayer box and I'll see that they get to uh, the prayer network. So let's take a moment and pray, shall we? Father, I simply thank you for this day. I thank you for these that have gathered here today. God, I thank you for the, the Mount of Transfiguration where Christ, before his disciples, was transfigured. I thank you, Father, that the church of Jesus Christ today is standing at the Mount of Transfiguration. And God, that you would, in the great outpouring of your spirit, lead us, guide us. If it's into the next millennium, God, we just ask your hand to be upon us. But if you come today, we ask the same, your hand to be upon us. In our God today, we pray for those that are sick and need healing. We pray for those that have relationships that need to be mended and healed. In our God today, that you, you would bring to us the very power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to live our life every day as you would have us to live. And Father, as we pray together today, we pray for our families to be protected by the blood of Jesus. We pray for our church family, Father, to be surrounded by the hedge of protection in the blood of Jesus. Our God, today we pray for our friends and those who need a touch of your hand. We pray for those who do not know you, that God, today, you, you, Father, would urge us to share the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. God, I, I remember as a, as a very, very, very young Christian reading a book called Good News for Modern Man. I thought it was some kind of a novel, but it turned out to change my life. And God, I thank you for the life-changing power that's in your word. And God, may your word be honored and blessed here today. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. amen. Our message today... 
I don't know about you, but this, this new format kind of feels funny to me. But it, it, it's okay because I know some of you won't have to do this at me. <laughs> Bill. But as we, we continue on through this, I believe that God is going to use us, Plymouth Church. And I believe he's going to use us in a bigger way than we've ever imagined. And I believe that each one of you is going to be a great integral part of that. And I thank you for being able to stand with us. The title of my message today is Faith Through the Storm. Faith through the storm. Jack, you fly. When you fly through a storm, what happens? <laughs> you go higher, right? An eagle does the same thing. An eagle doesn't fly in the storm. An eagle mounts up and flies over the storm. I don't know how they do that. But what I do know today is God's given us the ability to go through the storm. I want you to listen to James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. I'm going to read the whole thing. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. <coughs> but let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Or let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded. Unstable in all his ways. God gives us some very good insights here as to what he has for us to do and how we're to do it. Okay? First of all, I want to say that I love the Bible, I love God's Word. In the book of James, because James is a straight shooter. James doesn't pussyfoot around or tiptoe through the tulips. James just comes out and says what he has to say and says it. He doesn't pull any punches. James seems to have a knack of cutting straight to the heart of the matter. James 1, 2 through 8, we're looking at the topic of faith through the storm. Faith through the storm. The storm. Not faith in the storm. We need that. But this is faith through the storm. Faith through the storm. Have I said that enough? Do you have that in your mind? Okay. You see, because life has its storms, doesn't it? And we study these verses today, we learn some very important lessons. You can fall into trials. My brother and counter all joy when you fall into various trials. My brother and counter all joy. I want to point out here that there's a difference between falling into trials and walking into trials. Would you say that I, that's right? You know, you can, okay, let me give you an example. Before David was king, he used to serve King Saul. And Saul, tormented by a spirit, would try to give him, David would come and play and try to give him relief. King Saul was, picked up a spear and threw it at David, trying to kill him. That was nothing David did. 
David didn't go looking for that trouble. David was there doing what David had done many times before. Play on your harp, little David, play. So that he could, he could soothe that rage within Saul. But Saul, at this point, picked up a spear and threw it at David. He didn't ask for that, did he? David had done nothing wrong, but suddenly he's in the midst of danger, one of life's great trials. He fell into that trial. Have you ever been in a trial like that? Something you didn't do, something you didn't say, something you haven't been, or whatever, and all of a sudden you're in the midst of somebody wanting to maybe not necessarily kill you, but make it real nasty. Okay. There are trials that you walk into. These kind of trials don't come by chance. We cause them ourselves. Here's another illustration from David. Y'all know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? Y'all know what he did. Well, David was king. Saul is now gone. David is king, and he's doing his kingly thing, right? Walking around on the top of his roof. Overlooking the wonderful city that he is now the king of. Holy cow, look there. There was a lady on the rooftop below the palace. You know the palace had to be the highest place. In there was a lady on her rooftop taking a bath. And little David walked into this one. Oh, wow. He liked what he saw. He should have walked away. He should have turned around, walked away, and repented at that point. But no. David inquired, who is that woman that lives in that house? Well, servants went over and knocked. Her name's Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. He's one of David's mighty men of valor and war. Your eye's gone. So here comes David. He goes and has an affair with Bathsheba. Well, he's the king. He can do whatever he wants. I don't think so. A lot of kings think they can. A lot of presidents think they can. A lot of governors think they can. A lot of people think they can do whatever they want, and it's okay. But you're walking in. To a trial, to a trouble and a temptation. So what's he do? He sends for Uriah. He, he has an affair with her, and guess what? She gets pregnant. I should have used King James English. She was great with child. So he sends for Uriah, and Uriah the Hittite comes back, and he comes back home, and all of his men are out on the battlefield fighting, and, and David brings him in, hoping that he'll go in and he puts special food in and everything for them to have a wonderful love, clandestine meeting. And so that David could absolve himself of having of the baby. It would be Uriah's. But Uriah was a man of honor. And instead of going home, Uriah said, my men are fighting a battle in the battlefield. They're sleeping on the ground in tents. I'm going to sleep on the king's front porch. And when the king found that out, he sent him back to battle with a message to put him in the front lines of the battle. Not to be back where a commander normally is. Put him on the front lines. And then after a day or two, withdraw all the troops and leave Uriah there to die. David, trying to cover up his sin, committed murder. No, 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 no. Yeah, if you hire the hitman, you're just as guilty as the guy that pulled the trigger. Am I not right? Y'all watch CSI and NCIS and all that. You know that's true. It's on the Internet. It's got to be true. 
David now has committed murder. Adultery and murder and God's judgment come upon him. And life takes a sudden turn for the worse. David didn't fall into that temptation. David leaped into it. You see, but when you fall into trials of life, James suggests an unusual response. Let's hear that again. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. Count it all joy. You mean when the unemployment doesn't get back to me for two months? Count that joy. You mean when my family doesn't like me anymore? Count that joy. You mean when I lose my house? Count that joy. All I can report is what James said. Count it all joy. Rejoice. I believe that's one of the most difficult things to do. And it takes a whole lot of faith, doesn't it? When things aren't going right, it takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? When things are going wrong, it takes a lot of faith to believe for right, doesn't it? You see, it's easy to rejoice when everything's going good. It's easy to rejoice when the bank account's full. It's easy to rejoice when your health is great. It's easy to rejoice when you don't have any problems facing you. It's easy to rejoice in all those things. But let one little bitty trial come your way and rejoicings out the window. Doesn't take much faith to rejoice when everything's going right, does it? But when times are tough, when everything seems to be going wrong, it takes great faith. Remember what Jesus said about the, the, the one father, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. Great faith to trust God, to trust him enough to in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But what's the goal of all this? Well, James 1, verses 3 through 4 says this. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God wants to produce patience in our lives. I never used to understand that. I used to even tell people, don't pray for patience. Because when you do, you got to use them. I used to think it involved secular reason or circular reasoning. Why do we go through tests to get patience? Why do we need tests? Why do we need patience to go through tests? And it just keeps this up all the time. Doesn't make any sense to me. Didn't make a lot of sense. I used to think, why doesn't God skip the test and give us patience? But the word that we translate patience doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. When we talk about uh, people being impatient, y'all have a picture of Bill Beagle. Isn't that right, Jane? <laughs> Isn't that right, Jack? Every one of you know that's true. When you when you see the word impatient, the first person you think of, our pastor. What a jerk. <laughs> when we talk about people being impatient, we think of people who are in a hurry. They can't wait to get whatever it is where they're going. So a patient person must be somebody not in a hurry, right? This word that we're talking about patience literally means endurance and perseverance. It doesn't mean what y'all think patience means. It means endurance. It means perseverance. In other words, God is in the builders business of building tough people. What do you mean tough people? Tough people can endure. This quality is especially needed 
if you're living in today's day and age, isn't it? We have to be tough today. Not tough. But tough in the spirit. We have to be tough that we can endure to the end. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He could have said, he that has patience. And you would all laugh him to scorn. But that's what he meant. Make it to the end. Make it to the end. Here's an illustration for you. Back in the 1800s, <clears throat> there was an explorer, <clears throat> excuse me, named, <clears throat> named John Stewart. The most famous of all explorers in, in the Australian, uh, the whole continent of Australia. He was determined to find a way from uh, Adeline uh, in the south to the Indian Ocean in the north. And he kept trying and trying and trying and trying six times until he finally did it. It took six attempts. In the process, he contracted scurvy, <clears throat> lost the sight of his right eye, was attacked by aborigines, his clothing was reduced to nothing but rags, all for an earthly mission. An earthly mission. Can you imagine the perseverance God wants from us for a heavenly mission? Hmm. He knew what it meant to endure. Boy, those old-time explorers were pretty, pretty ruddy persons, weren't they? Think about Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Killed him a bar when he was only three. You see, there's a difference in generations. But the word of God tells us that there isn't. That this is what God's asking for. You see, the reason is that we are in a race. It isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. I shared this with Bob a little bit uh, yesterday. Um, I read of a man who ran a 100 meter uh, sprint, which is 380 feet, which is uh, 100 yards plus three yards plus some feet, whatever. He ran it in 9.58 seconds. Okay? That's pretty quick. Wouldn't you say? You know how fast that is in miles per hour? Bob, don't answer. 22.99 miles per hour he ran. Now, do you think he could run that fast in a marathon? For the whole marathon? Absolutely not. So what do you do? I know we don't have any marathoners in here, except maybe Eileen. When you train for a marathon, you train in intervals, you train in sprint, you train here, you train there, you do all these kinds of things. And the training is this. You train for the long run, not the sprint. And so many Christians today, the sprint comes in their minds. They think that this is a, a quick fix. It's not. He knew what it meant to endure. You must be able to go the distance. You must be able to go the distance. What? Which camera? Okay. Okay. I have a. I have people to do that. <laughs> Resume. Where is that? I can't find our Zoom. It was a notification came up, right? Yeah. Uh, is it broadcasting now? No, it says it ended. All right, here we go. Just do this. Uh, done. Share. Okay, now let's do this. This, get out of here.
Good live. Good live. Good live. Okay, Facebook. Go live. One, go live. Okay, go live. There it is. There you go. All right. We had technical difficulties fixed. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Are we okay now? That's what you were doing this for, John? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know where we stopped, and I'm just going to go on. So uh, I have two Facebook lives up today, so you're going to have to. You actually be probably better off to go to YouTube, and then you'll hear the whole thing. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> he that endures shall be saved, Matthew 24. I see far too many people drop out of the race over the years. We've watched it over and over and over again. It's easy to start, but God wants us to go the distance. We need wisdom. Why? All of a sudden, we're talking about trials and this. Now we need wisdom. It went off again. All right, don't worry about it. Okay? We, we need wisdom. Well, let me tell you something. The wisdom that we need is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, first of all, what's going on? James talking about trials of life. Now he's talking about wisdom. What's wisdom got to do with anything? Well, we need wisdom so that we can know how to re how to be responding to the trials that we're going through. The story I mentioned before, Saul tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. It tells us only three verses later what David did. Now, if that had been you or me, if that had been me, I'd have taken the spear out of the wall and threw it back at him. But listen to what David did. David behaved wisely in all his ways. There's a, a fellow named Gene Edwards. He wrote a book called um, The Tale of Three Kings. And in there, there's a line. And I want to share this line with you. And it says this. He was being interviewed in this segment. And he says, uh, the interviewer says, well, how do you keep from getting hit with spears? He said, well, first of all, I don't hang around with people that throw spears. He said, second of all, I've learned the artful uh, ability of dodging spears. And the third thing is, even if you're hit and it goes all the way to the heart, never let them know that you've been hit. What a, what, wait a minute. David acted wisely in all his ways. Wisdom is an important asset for us to be able to deal with trials. Now, some people think that wisdom comes from old age. I've got a different tale to tell you. I'm old, and there are some places I need a lot of wisdom in. Okay? This isn't just any wisdom, though. It's not man's wisdom. Here's an example. I want you to listen to this example of man's wisdom. Einstein said in 1932... There is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be attainable. Roosevelt, when he was still the assistant secretary of the United States Navy, said that planes could never be useful in battle against the fleet of ships. Of course, that was before Pearl Harbor. Man's wisdom. Charles Duell, Commissioner of the United States Patent Office, in 1899 made this statement. Listen carefully. Everything that has been invented has already been invented. Man's wisdom. 
Do you realize as we sit here and speak today that there are inventions being made more than were in the U.S. Patent Office in 1899 in one day? Kind of amazing, isn't it, what human wisdom is like? Even really smart people can say the dumbest things because of human wisdom is very limited, isn't it? But God wants us to have his wisdom. If you read Proverbs 1 through 9, you'll find a lot of qualities that are associated with wisdom. Their uh, instruction, understanding, prudence, dis uh, discernment, learning, knowledge. Hello? These are great qualities, and we have them. We need them when, when we're going through trials. So, how do you get wisdom? Well, let's look at James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It tells us very clearly how to get wisdom. But let him ask in faith with no doubting in his heart, who doubts like uh, the way that is driven by the sea, for let not that man suppose he will get anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. How do you get wisdom? You ask for it. By faith, you ask for wisdom. There have been times I've asked for wisdom and needed it greatly in a certain situation, and they've come through. But there have also been times when I was so daggone stubborn, I wouldn't ask for nothing, and I went through a trial of my own making. You see, James says that to get wisdom of God, all we need to do is ask him. We need to ask in faith. You need to ask believing, trusting that God will answer that prayer. Not that he'll put it on the back burner. Now, God answers a lot of different ways. Yes, no, and maybe. Or yes, no, and wait. I don't like the no's, but sometimes they're better than the yeses, to be honest with you. I'm so thankful that he said no about one girl I wanted to marry, and I ended up marrying her. Thank God for that. Of course, I didn't pray about wanting to marry that other girl. I didn't pray about marrying wanting to marry her. My mama did. Boy, isn't it funny how mamas can do things for you that you don't even know? Faith is essential. Listen to what it says in Matthew 11, 23 through 24. For assuredly I say unto you, whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you ask, when you ask and pray, believe that you receive them before you put them in your hand. Faith is essential if we expect to receive anything from God. Jesus said that the condition for receiving anything in prayer is that we first must believe. No doubting, James says. That's the person who doubts is double-minded. Literally, that doesn't mean two minds. It means double-souled, but it, it that's incongruent with God's formula. It simply is telling us that we have one voice telling us this and one voice telling us that. And so I ask you, who will you believe? Who will you believe? Will you believe God? Or will you believe Fox, CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS? I'm in trouble. Who are you going to believe? Well, bonjour. Y'all know that commercial, right? Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean that it's true. So what I want you to understand is this. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that at all. Be stable in your mind. 
God wants us to have his wisdom, and the way to get it is through single-minded faith. That's why they call lasting marriages monogamous, because we're single-minded. Ain't nobody else in the picture. Other people may try to push their way in the picture. There ain't nobody else in the picture. See what I'm saying? You understand? There ain't nobody else in the picture for me but her. And believe me, I've had the opportunities. But I love her and I love God. And if I say to you in a conversation that I love you, there's commitment behind that. I want you to understand that. I want you to understand that. Okay. God wants us to have wisdom, and the only way to get it is through single-minded faith. Here are the two qualities, wisdom and faith. Without wisdom, how can you know how to respond during the trials of life? But without faith, how can you face the storms of life and rejoice in it? Here's my closing statement. God has a plan and a purpose for us, even in these difficult times. Pray with me, please. Father, I truly thank you today. I, I give you praise and honor and glory today that by the power of your word, you will touch and change every heart that's hurt. God, not that we're so vile and wicked, we need to be changed, but God, every one of us needs to have our faith increase and needs to have our wisdom grow and needs our Father to be single-minded with you. So today, I ask your word to carry the weight of the gospel in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, Our God, Our Health, and Ages Past. dismiss us from this place, but never, ever from your presence. That, God, we would be people of faith and people of wisdom. And, God, today, that through the trials, we respond as David did, acting prudently upon thy word. God, may your Holy Spirit go with us today. Abide and protect us in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Hmm?